Hello everybody. Um, today is another Barnes Review radio show, so this is TBR Radio, and it's on the uh, current issue, which is the September-October 2016 issue. And uh, today I'm going to be joined by Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson. He's a good friend. We've done several broadcasts together. He's always excellent, as regular listeners will know. But before I bring him on, I just want to make people aware that um, when they go to barnesreview.org or barnesreview.com and they see TBR Radio in the menu bar... Uh, then next to that is podcast, and that's a series of podcasts that uh, Matt has done, and so I encourage people to go there and have a listen to those also. And of course, Matt also has a website, which is russjournal.org. That's rusjournal.org. So I'm going to bring him up right now. Matt, are you with me? I am with you. Thank you for having me on again. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, we've got an article today from the uh, current issue of the Barnes Review. It's uh, Well, before we get into it, um, we haven't spoken uh, for a bit, so is there any updates, anything you want to tell the audience? What have you been up to? Uh, how's everything going? Well, I have numerous books in the works. Um, I have uh, a book I've already completed on uh, Ukrainian nationalism. It's certainly topical today. I have a book uh, that I'm almost finished with on... Um, um, the Church Fathers and the Question of Nominalism. Uh, it's a book on metaphysics. Um, American Foreign Policy, um, the Russia-China Alliance. In fact, I have more books in the works uh, that really I am, I am, and this is all self-inflicted, but I am just uh, exhausted mm-hmm. most of the time. Um, when these come out, um, I'll let you know, uh, but, but that process takes a long time. But I have a tremendous research going on, and it, this is what I do, so I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, and as you know, you're... you're most welcome anytime you want to come on the show and do a show and certainly as you know articles and books come on always let me know and we can uh, do shows on these uh, and, and what you said reminded me uh, shortly before Eustace Mullins died I remember hearing him on a show and he seemed to he was saying that he had something like 18 books that he was working on and of course whatever happened to that output after he uh, died. I know he had, a, I think, a nephew that was selling some of his existing books, um, but you couldn't get all of them. So if you wanted to try and get something like The Curse of Cain, and I think that there's chances out there that want three, four hundred dollars for it. But uh, it's always interested me, and it's a fear as well of, of mine, Matt, uh, of of doing the work and somehow it doesn't get out. And I've always had that fear that. You know, when I've been doing my books, oh, are they going to shut down the internet or or are they going to shut this down or are they going to ban this sort of content before you get the chance to publish when you've put all those hours of work in? Uh, What are your thoughts on that? Well, as an American, uh, it's not that big of a deal. No, that's true. Uh, The the First Amendment protects us, but but that's not really that that concerning because America is run by private interests and the Constitution only refers to the government. Um, and yet private capital is far more powerful uh, and is treated is it not only are we not protected from it, but uh, the Constitution treats or, or the, the, the interpretation of the Constitution treats these corporations as people. So they are protected uh, uh, in the same way we are. So that's really where the, the repression is. Um, the First Amendment is, is of no concern. Uh, we, we know that we're, we're going to be protected in, in, in that respect. But whether or not the people who actually are in charge um, we'll put anything on the shelves. That's that's another matter, and so it's it's that people still can't comprehend that private actors are just as capable of repression as, as governments are, and in, in the liberal West, um, you know, freedom has long since been quashed by these conglomerates uh, who have more power than, than any government, and um, and are protected by the Constitution in, in their in their activities. So that, that that changes everything. Yes, I mean indeed, you know. You've got the First Amendment, but then you've got employers that are looking at people's Facebook uh, pages before they they look to employ them. And, oh, you said this or you've got this belief. And so we don't want you because you you don't believe 100 percent in multiculturalism or, you know, uh, things of of that nature. And so whilst the First Amendment is there, there's no protection for from uh, employers choosing not to employ you on exercising your First Amendment rights. And uh, as we see, you know, with the uh, various professors that we talked about in the last show, in your editorial, in the last uh, uh, issue of the Barnes Review, and you, you know, rightly said it was a disgrace that academic freedom is being stifled by political correctness. Well, it's, you know, I, I never liked using abstract phrases, uh, you know, like, like, like rights or, or academic freedom. 
my stuff deserves to be heard because I'm right. Yeah. Uh, not because I have a right to say it. Uh, our ideas um, aren't, aren't all equal. Um, I, I'm the way, you know, I've, I've sacrificed a lot to live the life that I do um, because I'm right. Because, because I've been forced to believe this stuff because that's where the history is. I didn't want any of this stuff, but when you are open to the facts and willing to suffer for them, then this you have no choice. My, I, I have a strong belief, Andy, that if self-interest were to be totally removed from our mind, um, the truth on any of these questions isn't really that hard to find. But when you're concerned with your reputation, what people will think, being fashionable, and all, all aspects of that term, even subconsciously, um, you, know, you start believing nonsense for the sake of fitting in. And um, I've been cursed with, with the ability to remove self-interest in a lot of my work. And it's led to nothing but trouble because, because here we are uh, struggling on the fringes um, as the world goes to hell. So um, I don't think the absolute truth is, is it can be found. I don't think it's all that hard. Um, but self-interest will always uh, derail us. Yes, I agree. And, um, you know, that being said, let's uh, have a look at this uh, article. It's an excellent article. Um, it's uh, on page 72 of the current issue, as I say, which is the September-October 2016 issue. I encourage the listeners to subscribe to the Barnes Review. Go to barnesreview.com. Uh, and it's entitled Myths, sorry, fact, Facts and Myths about Joseph Stalin's anti-Semitic Russian nationalism. And I'll read the start of the article. It is widely maintained that Joseph Stalin, Stalin was pro-Russian and was anti-Semitic. Even American patriots and history buffs who ought to know better are often imbued with this bit of wisdom. Was Stalin, though, although a known mass murderer and paranoid maniac, somehow, perhaps secretly, a true son of the motherland working to free Russia from Jewish Bolshevik tyranny? Unfortunately, that is wishful thinking by some people who fail to realise that such flights of fancy only play into the hands of the self-chosen few who aim to rule the world uh, by I, I, didn't, I didn't write that. Oh, that was okay. written by the, by the editor. No, that was, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I just, I would never write like that. That's, um, that was written by um, one of the editors uh, oh. as the introduction to, to the article. Oh, OK. Well, thanks for pointing that out as well, because I always read those bits out when, uh, when I'm interviewing um, one of the contributors. So I'm, I'll be aware next time. Um, but that now my article actually... starts uh, almost without exception. Yeah. So we'll go from there. So I'm only going to go through the first uh, uh, paragraph or so. So almost without exception, American and Western court historians and a growing number of revisionists, unfortunately, paint Joseph Stalin as both a Russian nationalist and an anti-Semite. The latter especially is believed without question. Stalin is presented this way because it allowed the Western left to oppose the USSR in good conscience. Nationalism was universally hated by the ruling class, from campus anarchists to corporate billionaires. Hence, to recall Stalin as a nationalist is to make him non-socialist. Communism as a vague ideology was never a problem in the minds of the US State Department or Western corporate capital. Obviously, since corporate capital built the USSR, socialism was part of the profit structure of American capitalism. Only nationalism was to be fought. Therefore, allowing Stalin to be hated by the left required him to be recast as a nationalist and anti-Semite. And, sorry, as with all American academic dogma, this is false. So over to you, Matt, for, uh, please uh, elaborate on that uh, paragraph. Well, that's the introduction and, and thesis. Um, my career over the last five years uh, has been almost exclusively on, on the Soviet Union uh, because none of the, uh, you know, I'm at a stage now where, you know, kind of what the average American, the average Englishman thinks is true historically, none of it is right. Uh, when we're at a point we can't even talk to each other anymore. We're not even defining the words in the same way. Nothing they believe is true. Uh, the Soviet Union, um, once I read Anthony Sutton's uh, three-volume work detailing all the American and Western European corporations that created the USSR, and you know, he lists all the receipts, and there was no question about it. You know, all first-hand documents that they built, the, the Gulag camps were built with Western capital. After the Civil War, uh, and after World War One, you, you know, en engineers and, and scholars in this field were, were in very short supply. They had to import them. Trotsky even admits that. Um, Stalinism uh, frightened the left in general. Now, it's true that even, you know, leftists who disliked Stalin wouldn't criticize him because you had that, that, that doctrine of no enemies on the left. 
But that didn't last very long. Once Khrushchev said it was okay to criticize Stalin, then Marxism split into, into numerous camps. Um, the, the myth, there's so many myths, I don't even know where to begin, but the main myth here is that socialism and communism, even in the Soviet variety, is good, but it was so badly distorted by Stalin that there is really no way to judge the Soviet Union objectively. It could have worked had Stalin not, not done anything, uh, had not existed. The problem with that is having read all of Stalin's works, Trotsky's works, Lenin's works, um, having studied Soviet legislation practically my entire adult life, there is no difference, not in ideology or in policy, among Stalin, Trotsky, or Lenin whatsoever. I mean, if they exist, they're very, very minor. The big difference between Lenin, uh, between uh, Stalin and, and Trotsky was the Jewish question. Uh, Stalin never hurt anyone because they were Jewish. He enforced the ban on anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. But that's, that Trotsky was very much motivated by Jewish nationalism. Uh, but otherwise, it was nothing more than, than power. The difference between Stalin and Lenin was that Stalin had a much larger bureaucracy, had a, you know, he, he, they were already well into the process of building the Soviet Union. Lenin and Trotsky had kind of a, almost an anarchistic society, traumatized by war. Uh, only Stalin uh, had kind of inherited a, a very powerful bureaucracy, and then he could repress uh, in a far more efficient way. Had Lenin, you know, um, Lenin and Stalin been reversed, they would have had the same policy. Uh, Lenin advocated uh, the exact same sort of repression that Stalin did, um, and terrorism and revolution, of, uh, with, uh, Trotsky's uh, famous book, he apologizes for uh, and defends terrorism as a mode of social control over and over again. So there's absolutely no, no question that they are identical in every way, uh, in, every, in every way, ideology and in, and in policy. It was just a matter of power, um, one faction against another, that allowed um, Stalin to e exile Trotsky. It had nothing to do with ideology and nothing to do with tactics. Everything people think about the Soviet Union is incorrect. Thank you, Matt. And um, indeed, uh, you've got a quote here from Stalin. You write, um, Stalin was a philo-Semite to the core. In his reply to an inquiry of the Jewish news agency in the United States in 1931, Stalin writes, National and racial chauvinism is a vestige of the misanthropic customs characteristic of the period of cam cannibalism. Anti-Semitism as an extreme form of racial chauvinism is the most dangerous vestige of cannibalism. Anti-Semitism is of advantage to the exploiters as a lightning conductor that deflects the blows aimed by the working people at capitalism. Anti-Semitism is dangerous for the working people as being a false path that leads them off the right road and lands them in the jungle. Hence communists, as consistent internationalists, cannot but be irreconcilable, sworn enemies of anti-Semitism. In the USSR, anti-Semitism is punishable with the utmost severity of the law as a phenomenon deeply hostile to the Soviet system. Under USSR law, active anti-Semites are liable to the death penalty. So clearly not a nationalist, uh, Matt. Absolutely not. Um, now I want to clarify, it's the, the quote was published in 1936 uh, but it was translated initially made in 1931. Um, the Jewish news, news agency in the U.S. Uh, published it in English in 1931. It didn't come out uh, in Pravda until November 30th of 1936. So that's why there's there's two uh, separate dates there. But this is such a late um, quotation. Uh, he was already involved in, in you know, starving Ukraine at this time. And you can't say that he was just you know rally, rallying the troops with Marxism, if this were an earlier one, he was already in power. Um, th so there's absolutely no question about it. Uh, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you uh, some time ago, but uh, BBC ran a, um, a mini series on um, North Korea, yep. and their argument their mm -hmm. argument was, and this is very similar to the to the thesis here. The argument was North Korea isn't socialist or Bolshevik; uh, it's nationalist, and they don't give a whole lot of reasons for that. But the reason is, you know, leftists still have this romance for the Soviet system. They can't allow, and yet very few leftists are going to support North Korea. So they have to make it a right-wing regime, and then it's okay. And, and that was the situation with, with Stalin. They need to make him an anti-Semite 
I need to exaggerate any uh, purge of, of Jews in, in, in Soviet society uh, and pin it on Stalin uh, so that now it's OK, especially uh, when Khrushchev was in power. Now it's OK to hate the USSR. Um, it wasn't before, but now now you can. And it's happening in North Korea, too. Whenever whenever um, the left simply can't they can't stomach North Korea, but they will therefore they will never call it communist. It is a right wing regime. Then it's OK. And that's what they're doing here. Um, and it's just making it palatable for leftists to to um, to despise. Yes. And uh, one thing that sticks out to me about that quote, um, Matt, do you think it's fair to say that um, uh, what's known as globalists today could also be known as internationalists? Absolutely. Yes. I usually use those terms uh, interchangeable. As interchangeable. Yeah, because my point is, is that he says, hence communists as consistent internationalists. So basically what we're being told here is that global, globalism is communism. Well, or, or, or that, that Bolshevism is internationalist. Yeah. Um, has, as its central, central, I mean, there's lots of ideologies that are internationalist, uh, Bolshevism being one. But you see, if, if you go down a bit in the article, um, Stalin's view on what the future is going to be uh, for... Um, uh, for the world revolution, once the entire world, uh, it's actually in, in 1923, you see it's about, about halfway uh, through the article, you'll see what Stalin says has to happen. Um, you know, Americans have this tendency, they like one-liners. You know, one line is good enough to summarize a, a writer. And and the one line that, that, that they like to use for Stalin is, is socialism in one country. Somehow that's supposed to mean that Stalin was a nationalist. That's sufficient to convict him of, of, of that crime. And the only real difference, the only, the only thing he meant there, uh, it, it, it concerned a, and this comes up again and again and again, what he's talking about is that he was willing to work with leftist but non-communist parties in the West to create the Popular Front. And then eventually, over time, like they, what occurred in the Soviet Union, um, slowly but surely take over. Uh, given they their, their, had more money and they had greater discipline. Um, there were some party members that rejected that approach, wanted everything purely a bolts of it. That's ultimately what, what socialism in one country, that was the context in which that was uttered. Um, it, it didn't mean that I mean, Stalin was a, was a firm believer in global revolution. He exported revolution to every country he possibly could. It didn't mean that he was just going to have a fortress uh, USSR. Um, it just meant that for the moment... It's okay um, for us to be the only Bolshevik state, uh, but to assist um, non-Bolshevik socialist parties throughout the world. And then maybe one day, uh, once they're in power, we'll be able to take over. That's all he meant by that. Uh, one line, one, the one-liner concept is very common in America, and I'm, it's ridiculous. It's never right. It's never in the proper context. Uh, but that's one that comes up with Stalin again and again. But today, you take any college course on the Soviet Union, read any book, academic or otherwise, on Stalin, they will call him a nationalist and a anti-Semite. Um, it's very rare that you'll find tons and tons of, of, of evidence for it. Um, and one of the reasons it's allowed to, to stand is that the someone who is trying to argue with that would have to say, well, all the old Bolsheviks were Jews. Stalin was purging the old Bolsheviks. He wasn't purging them as Jews. But it just so happens that, that they were almost all Jewish. So it's very easy to spin that as he's, he's, attacking, he's attacking Jews. Now, they don't want to say either one of those things. They certainly don't want to say that they were all Jewish, meaning that the Bolshevik Revolution was Jewish. So they let it go. And that's why that fear is one of the reasons that this myth has been allowed to, uh, has been allowed to, uh, uh, to grow and to fester. And I have, right, right after that quote, I have um, uh, the only line they ever used to try to, they've also kind of tried to claim that Joseph Stalin was a monarchist, that he was um, uh, reviving the veneration for the czars. And there's one one quote they use, and there's only one that exists, uh, for that. And that's sufficient to convict him of being not only an anti-Semite and a nationalist, but a monarchist on top of it. And it's absolute garbage. Yes, absolutely. And um, moving on to a, 
a uh, quote from Petro and Skorkin, 1999, uh, that you've included in the article. They say, even in absolute numbers, the Jews made up the largest group in the leadership of the Stalinist secret police. The Russian myth of the Jewish NKVD thus had a factual basis. The Nazis, who knew precisely of this fact, used it for their propaganda purposes against the Jewish Bolshevik terror regime that they felt obligated to destroy. So, um, any uh, further information on the NKVD and the um, Jewish representation within that, uh, Matt? I think that was originally from the Polish, so it was NKWD. Um, I don't know if they correct that. My original, that's what it says, may not look like that in the, in the issue. Um, I don't remember if I translated that from from uh, Ukrainian or Polish or not, uh, but that's exactly what I mean. Uh, you'll 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 find this, you know, he allegedly you know destroyed the Jews in the Soviet system, and yet you see their name everywhere. You see them in every major position, especially in the police forces. Uh, that you know it's, it can't be true that, and it's odd how how rare you find Jews in the American police, especially in the local level. American policemen being Jews, extremely rare. And yet in the Soviet Union, they were wildly overrepresented. I think that's a curious fact. Yes, and now moving on to, um, we discussed this before the show, and this is something um, I appear to have, I've, I've had people email me about this before, and it was uh, the name um, Dugashvili, which was Stalin's real name. And, uh, you know, I accept now that I've been in error in my book, um, Basically, what I put was Joseph Stalin, a Georgian, became, becomes Premier of the Soviet Union. This is the 1924 entry in the Synagogue of Satan. Joseph Stalin's real name is Jugashvili, which translates from Georgian as son of a Jew. In the Georgian language, Vili means son of and Juga means Jew. Stalin also has three wives in his lifetime, Ekaterina Sfnitse, Kadya Alavija and Rosa Kaganovich, all of them Jewesses. Interestingly, Stalin passes a law during his premiership that resulted in anyone found guilty of anti-Semitism being sentenced to death. Well, we've covered that aspect. Um, but yeah, um, you've actually got Georgian dictionaries and uh, the, uh, that interpretation that uh, the name translates as son of a Jew is actually incorrect. Absolutely. And, and I'm th I thank you for, for bringing it up. And I want to take this time to, to dispel this myth. It comes up, I, I believe it for a long time. I have a uh, not a whole lot of Georgian speakers, you know, that you come across every day in, in the U.S. or in England. Um, Georgians are almost unique, totally unique in that respect, that, you know, most of the Georgians in the world live in Georgia. Um, so it's easy for myths like that to get started. I have a, a Georgian to English dictionary. Um, the, the word for, for Jew is Israeli. Uh, there is no other synonym there. I have a friend in the Georgian embassy. Um, I contacted him and I asked him about it. He said that there no, no way has that word ever been used for Jew. It is not the word for Jew at all. Um, so that's simply a false. It, it's it's a falsehood. It's a myth. Uh, that's not what the what the name means whatsoever. Yes, and I mean um, there's another bit here, and I'm, uh, this is the caption underneath a picture of Stalin with his son Vasily and daughter Svetlana, so I'm not sure that uh, you wrote this in or if this was put in by the editor, but I'll read it anyway and then you can comment. Uh, it's just as they got the picture, it says, Joseph Stalin far right is shown with his son Vasily and daughter Svetlana. Stalin was not Jewish, but he enforced the death penalty against anyone defaming Jews in the USSR. Stalin could speak Yiddish and he was born in a heavily Jewish area of Georgia. His second wife, Nedzada Aliyuva, and it says Aliyua is Hebrew for Hallelujah, was Jewish. His mistress, Rosa Kaganovich, sister of Lazar, one of Stalin's murderous henchmen, was also Jewish. Leventry Beria speaks of Stalin's endless affairs with women, all Jewesses. Stalin's elite were overwhelmingly Jewish and his secret police were controlled by three men. Donrik Yagoda, Nikolai Yetzov and Berea, all Jewish. One of the main architects of the terror famine was Yakov Yakovlev, whose real name was Epstein. Lazar Kogan, son of rich Jews, was a high-ranking organiser of the Gulag system along with Matvai Berman. While not Jewish himself, few promoted their interests as aggressively as Stalin. Uh, what are your thoughts on... Uh, do you have anything else to add to that or clarification? I did write that. Um, I forgot about that. I, I did caption uh, at least some of those pictures, uh, and that was really just to just to uh, drive that point home. If Stalin was anti-Semitic, then he was the most incompetent anti-Semite anti <laughs> in the world. 
He surrounded himself with Jews, married them. His children married Jews. They were everywhere. Uh, how this escapes the, the, the authors that, that write book after book about Stalin's anti-Semitism is, is beyond me. Uh, but it has become it has become a fashion. And um, there is a connection with the neoconservatives as well, because the neocons came out of that exile group with Trotsky, um, who then saw the Stalinist Soviet Union as, as the incarnation of evil, the incarnation of, of um, anti-Semitism and nationalism. Slowly but surely, that morphed the people like Schachmann and, and, and everyone else, that morphed into what ridiculously called the neoconservative ideology. Uh, and it all comes from this idea that that um, it was OK to hate the Soviet Union um, if and only if someone like Stalin would run it. Otherwise, it was a romantic uh, experiment in, in social justice. So there is even a, a neoconservative connection here. Uh, those following Trotsky uh, soon abandoned uh, socialism because over time they thought that, that Stalinism might be the natural outgrowth of Leninism. And and uh, they, they developed you know, some very vague. Uh, I mean, there are still leftists in, in many things, and uh, these people have been in charge of American foreign policy for uh, for a very long time. But the main thing that holds them all together is the absolute hatred for Stalin uh, on the one hand and their own Jewishness on the other. So there's even a connection with them. Thanks, Matt. And um, moving forward a couple of pages, um, you write, the USSR had a decisive voice on the issue of the establishment of the Israeli state in 1948, and it was used again in favour of the Jews. In addition, the Soviet Union was the first country to recognise the new Jewish state and to establish diplomatic relations with it. The Soviet Union supplied military aid to the Zionists, not only a huge amount of weapons, but military experts and volunteers. On Stalin's orders, Molotov wrote, Our brotherly feelings towards toward the Jewish people are determined by the fact that they begat the genius and the creator of the ideas of the communist liberation of mankind, Karl Marx, that the Jewish people, alongside the most developed nations, brought forth countless prominent scientists, engineers and artists, and gave many glorious heroes to the revolutionary struggle. And in our country, they gave and are still giving new remarkable and talented leaders and managers in all areas of development and defence of the cause of socialism. And that's from Solzhenitsyn to 2002 chapter 19 so um anything uh let's discuss that now their involvement in the establishment of the israeli state in 1948 and also what you could offer us regarding solzhenitsyn because i believe his last book um last i heard it had not been translated and i wondered if you'd uh, you'd read that you're referring to 200 years together that's the one um, yeah. i i read the entire thing in the original uh it has not been translated um Solzhenitsyn made arguments. I did even before I read it. I, I didn't even realize he was making them um, that that were similar to mine, including that there is no way that anyone, any sane person, could see Stalin as, as an anti-Semite. Um, this is from uh, 200 Years Together. There are some chapters of that book that have been translated by someone else. Um, I I, uh, I translated this from from the Russian. Uh, Sol, uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, said that this was this was Molotov, but it actually really was Stalin. Uh, Molotov was simply delivering a, a message. Um, and there was a time after Stalin's death that, you know, the word Zionist um, was a bad thing. But that was for a few reasons. Uh, number one, Zionist referred to nationalism, uh, Jewish nationalism in that case. Any nationalism was banned in the Soviet Union. So Zionism, by definition, was something that was harmful to it. Uh, you know, number two, um, there came a time where the, the West simply had more spare money, simply had more cash to give to, to the Jewish state. Um, it, it was much easier to manipulate Washington, D.C. Than, than Moscow. And so the Israeli state eventually just leaned to, to the West, and it became an outpost of, of American interests uh, in the Middle East. Therefore, the Soviet Union supported Syria and Egypt for a while and Iraq, uh, etc., um, so, um, so that's really what you know, it had nothing to do with any support of American values or anything like that. It was just that the U.S. was able to give a better deal than than the Soviets uh, were able to. The Soviets were were far harder on their allies than than the Americans were, and uh, certain conditions the Jews couldn't um, couldn't adhere to. And plus, there are a lot more Jews in America than there are in in, in Russia at the time. Yes, and regarding Solzhenitsyn. Um... Now, I read somewhere, and this may or may not be true, that um, uh, Russian school children are given, you know, 
his work forms part of their curriculum. Um, I don't know if, you, if you're aware if that's the case or not. And also, uh, what would you recommend to the readers, um, your thoughts on Souls and Itzin and his work? And is there any of his work that you would recommend to the readers? And sorry to just tag this question on at the end. Uh, this uh, book, um, 200 Years Together, um, that you mentioned, it has not been translated, whereas the other books have. Is there a reason, in your opinion, that this has not been translated? Uh, because of, of Vladimir Putin... Uh, Solzhenitsyn is very, very popular, and his works are read. I don't know if they're a day-to-day part of the curriculum there, but they're extremely important there. Um, Putin uh, made him, when he was still alive, you know, a hero of the state. Putin was very, very clear that the Soviet form of socialism was doomed, and it destroyed a lot of very good people. I mean, Stalin went to prison for one reason, and that he had been captured by the Germans briefly. That was enough. You know, he was contaminated. Uh, that, that, was, that was enough to get someone sent to the gulag. It was, it was idiotic. Um, you know, Putin, and like, like many others, were willing to work within the system while it existed. Uh, but um, this, this book really scared the Jews greatly because it was really hard to argue with Solzhenitsyn's um, fame and his, uh, his prestige. When he and he always it was very very clear that he he blamed the Jews for the Soviet Union to a great extent, um, but but let's also understand that he is not venerated in the West anymore. Um, you you will find a lot of tremendously negative uh, works on Solzhenitsyn. Um, you know people like um, uh, they they had more like uh, they they had more safe alternatives like like Andrei Sakharov. Uh, they turned to him rather than Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn was a Russian nationalist, and not only was he a, a an orthodox, a firm orthodox believer, he was an old believer, and he was part of the old believer movement in, in America and the uh, old believer movement in, in Russia under the Moscow Patriarchate. So he firmly believed that that the world prior to Peter the Great was the true Russia, as I believe. Um, I knew that he had been, you know, he supported uh, the Russian Orthodox Church wherever it manifested itself. Uh, but but especially the old believer movement that that group that simply wouldn't accept the liturgical changes under the patriarch Nikon in 1667 and the Petrine state uh, under Peter the Great that followed and uh, they were they had 20 25 million members uh, by the time of the fall of the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and this is where uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, not only for for religious reasons but for political reasons accepted that group they're not nearly as large today. But um, he was part of a old believer faction that was allied with the already existing Church of Russia. Most of them today are, are separated from that, and they, they run their own affairs. Uh, so with that kind of background, with his prestige, um, they have absolutely banned this book from being, again, it's private sector people. It's not the government. Uh, it's major corporations will not allow this to be, to be published. Um, somebody, I don't know who it was, there's a few chapters online um, uh, a book that I would recommend, uh, politically speaking, is Under the Rubble, which is a, a, uh, a series of, uh, or uh, sorry, Out from the Rubble, a, a series of, of essays just around the time the Soviet Union um, collapsed. Solzhenitsyn hated the idea and was opposed to privatization and all the buccaneer capitalism garbage that occurred in the early 1990s uh, that was far harder on, on Russians than, than Stalin was. His opinion was that the old Soviet institutions have to remain, but slowly be transformed. Uh, he predicted, uh, he's the only, the only man in the world who predicted the fall of the Soviet Union when it did, and predicted what would happen with the mass um, privatization schemes. Zeus being heavily involved with that as well. Uh, Yuri Gaidar really ran the country at the time, not Boris Yeltsin, who hardly ever knew, knew where he was um, uh, throughout the 90s. Uh, Gaidar was, was Jewish. Uh, he was a real power uh, there. And so um, Sol- Solzhenitsyn predicted all of this, and he's the only man who predicted this. And um, uh, this is, you know, it, it, which is uncanny in his case. He saw the Jews at both ends, not only the foundation of the Soviet Union, but then its dissolution, and then taking that capital that the Russian worker had created and uh, sending it overseas uh, to benefit themselves in bank accounts in New York uh, and, in, and in Geneva. Uh, he is not, you know, in academia today. He is, he is almost verboten. Um, too much of his, especially since uh, 200 years together, 
that came out uh, about 15 years ago now. Uh, I taught him when I taught in my regular Stovey class at, at Mount St. Mary's University. Uh, I taught him on, on regular rotation, and, and, and I got in a lot of trouble for it. Um, I told him to go to hell, but it, it is not um, – uh, he, he is not venerated in, in America uh, like a lot of people think, think he is, and this is part of the reason why. Yes, and he made an interesting comment about um, privatisation. Uh, and uh, earlier in the week, I had uh, Ron, Ronald Ray on, Ron Ray, and he's got an article in the same issue about the Herb Reeson book, The Jewish Mafia, and he put an interesting um, uh, line in here. He said, privatisation is always a code word for transfer of wealth to Jewish hands. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, for, for Russia scholars, you know, that's kind of old news. Um, that's exactly what it meant. It was a, it was a, um, it was a swindle. It was an absolute disaster. I mean, 80% of the Soviet economy was, was destroyed, liquidated, moved out of the country, put in other people's pockets. By comparison, uh, World War II destroyed maybe 40% of the Soviet economy. Nothing was worse than what happened in the early 90s. I mean, the, pop, the fall of the population, the the, the male lifespan went under 60 for a while. Alcoholism, I mean, Russia was absolutely disappearing, which suited a lot of people in the West um, very well. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people don't realize I have an article on my, on my website. Um, the Justice Department in the U.S. sued Harvard University because they were involved in these privatization deals. Every single person, uh, by the way, I have them all listed, were Jewish ethnically. Uh, that were you know, they were kind of giving the intellectual background to it, and the Justice Department won. They sued them for the misappropriation of funds that they took government money and used it in projects in Russia that were absolutely disastrous, humiliating uh, the West, humiliating um, uh, concepts of the free market. And um, and they won, and that uh, it was, I think the institute was called the Institute for Transition Economy was shut down. Uh, Lauren Summers was there at the time, was implicated in this. So so even there, um, you know, the U.S. government now officially says uh, through the Justice Department lawsuit that, that this was a, a disastrous time. It was a misuse of government funds. The government funds were were uh, from the U.S. were used to help uh, speed privatization. And all it did was empower the Jewish mafia. Uh, the Russian mafia, of course, is almost exclusively Jewish. The oligarchs in Russia are almost exclusively Jewish with one exception. That's Potanin. Um, it's it's clearly an ethnic movement, just like Bolshevism was. And it's amazing how at both ends of the spectrum, uh, you have the exact same group of people doing the exact same thing. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm pleased you mentioned Patonin because I forgot the name. There was like seven of these oligarchs and he was the only non-Jew and he was the one that they put in the forefront while the other others lurked behind, which is a similar tactic of theirs. Yes. Well, there's a, there's a video on YouTube, probably my favorite video of all time. Um, Oleg Deproska, a uh, Jewish oligarch, um, runs uh, owns several steel steel mills and, and aluminum processing plants in, in Russia. Uh, Putin marches in there uh, during a board meeting and says, "I hear you guys are going to liquidate, move the move the com- uh, country uh, move the company out of the country and liquidate your holdings here." He said, "You're not going to do that. I have a a contract here that you are going to sign." That says you're going to stay here and continue uh, your operations. And these guys, like little sheep, like little puppies, went up and, and signed it. So um, I remember even in Deprosky himself, you know, one of the most powerful men in Russia, one of the wealthiest men in the world, walks away from, from signing the, the contract. And then Putin says, give me back my pen. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did, you know, just to add to the humiliation. You see, he can do that. He can do that because he's incredibly popular. And he doesn't owe anything to the Jews or to um, the oligarchs. His backing comes from the security services and now from the, the common population. What Putin did, I'll, I'll, I'll get off topic here a little bit, but I don't care. What Putin did from 2000 to, let's say, 2010 is almost unprecedented in world history. Russia was disappearing. The Russian government didn't exist. The taxes were not being collected. Uh, there was no chain of command in the military, which explains the disaster in Chechnya. Um, no one was showing up for the draft. It just wasn't a functional. Con- Russia then was simply uh, Jewish clans carving out their, their little feasts. And Putin 
uh, slowly but surely, with a handful of strong, uh, usually military or police uh, associates, rebuilt that country from the ground up. So now it has a first-rate military and is now the sixth largest economy in the world. Had he not stepped in, uh, there would be no Russia today. And that, that kind of feat is, is extraordinary. And it, it shows you how powerful he is and why he's so popular. Yes, and I've got the last part of the article that I flagged up because we, you know, I encourage people to go to barnesreview.com uh, and subscribe. Um, we don't want to just read the articles verbatim for you. We want to uh, discuss them and encourage you to uh, to subscribe, as I said, because it's an excellent publication and this is another excellent article. Now, um, the last bit that I flagged up is called Stalin. You've given it the uh, subtitle Stalin and Russian Nationalism. And I'll read through this, and um, then after that, Matt, we've got about 15 minutes left, so you can take this in any direction you want and uh, go on to any topic you want. So I'll just read this out. Stalin was anti-Russian, as were all Soviet communists. He was quite systematic and ideological in this. It was not a matter of political convenience. Stalin's works are available to all in English, yet they are apparently little read. He writes concerning the heritage of Russian dominance in their own country. And uh, this is what he says, and it's out of uh, Stalin, National Facts, Factors in Party and State of Affairs from 1923. Here we go. This heritage consists, firstly, in the survivals of dominant nation chauvinism, which is a reflection of the former privileged position of the great Russians. These survivals still persist in the minds of our Soviet officials, both central and local. They are entrenched in our state institutions, central and local. They are being reinforced by the new great Russian chauvinist spirit, which is becoming stronger and stronger owing to the NEP. In practice, they find expression in an arrogantly disdainful and heartlessly bureaucratic attitude on the part of Russian Soviet officials towards the needs and requirements of the national republics. The multinational Soviet state can become really durable and the cooperation of the peoples within it really fraternal, only if these survivals are vigorously and irrevocably eradicated from the practice of our state institutions. Hence, the first immediate task of our party is to vigorously combat the survival of great Russian chauvinism. Over to you, Matt. I, I couldn't. I had to read that. I, I read it in, in, in his works are available online in English. Uh, all of it, it's like, you know, 25 volumes. I couldn't believe it. He's condemning Russians for being dominant in Russia. I don't know who he expected, um, but this is an outrage to him that Russians are, are dominant in, in the Russian uh, state. And that now, though, uh, that's over. Russians will not be dominant. Russian culture, actually all the cultures of uh, all, all the, uh, you know, this prison, this prison, of the Soviet Union, all these cultures were banned. They had to be re reworked, remade, history rewritten. None of it was allowed to survive. Uh, harmless things like cuisine, you know, that was permitted. But of course, in Russia, in Georgia, in Ukraine, the church was the culture. Uh, there's no separating the two. The word culture comes from the cult. It's, it's a spiritual concept. Um, and with the church destroyed, forced underground, uh, that meant Russia was. You know, Russian culture without the church doesn't make any sense. It's like talking about Tibet without mentioning Buddhism. It's, it's stupid. Um, but for him to condemn the dominant nation chauvinism, it, it is, that's like saying, you know, Russians may not even be sovereign in Russia. Uh, this quote is it, early, just before, before Lenin's death. But he is clearly, it's a very chilling quote because he's going to purge uh, either Russians as an ethnic group, which would be really hard to do in Russia, um, or at least those who had any kind of uh, belief in, in Russian history and, and, and Russian culture as a whole. Um, nationalism was banned throughout the, the Soviet Union. The starvation of Ukrainian farmers was very real. Khrushchev and the KGB um, in the 1964-65 in the, uh, laid out in detail what Stalin did to, um, uh, to the Ukrainians. I might note here, by the way, uh, I have this on the Barnes Review blog, um, and I should I should do more work on it. There was a whole revisionist movement in academia financed by all the big foundations uh, to deny the Holocaust in in Ukraine. Now, these are the same people who, of course, will condemn uh, the Jewish Holocaust, you know, any denial of that to the skies and ban it throughout Europe. 
but there was in America a, a full revisionist movement, uh, Holocaust revisionist movement against um, against the Ukrainians. That there was no no Holocaust, or at least not as bad as, as the Ukrainians say. It wasn't Stalin's fault. Stalin was not a totalitarian. He had some authoritarian tendencies. This was a legitimate academic subculture in Russian history in, in the in the uh, 70s and in, in the 80s. Now, they got blown away when the KGB archives were opened, but strangely enough, no one lost their jobs. Uh, you would think that this kind of ridiculous error would would force them to lose their jobs. They 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 base themselves around something that is now they don't exist anymore. But Sheila Fitzpatrick is one of these people. Uh, I think she still teaches. Uh, you know that old hag should have should have been fired right away. You know her career was based around this. So a whole Holocaust revisionist movement existed in American academia and England as well, uh, denying uh, denying the Holocaust. Well, the reason that the Holocaust in Ukraine occurred is that the West was feeding the Soviet Union. You know, there was a time where the czars were feeding the world. But because of the total mismanagement of, of agriculture, uh, Western states, either through donations or sales, was feeding the Soviet Union. Therefore, they could destroy their own farmers. The Soviet Union never could feed itself. Um, there was no time without American help and American assistance, there would be no Soviet Union. Even to the point of, of extreme crisis in food production, the, the you know, Archer Daniels Midland and ConAgra and the American government and the Canadian government were, were financing and, and sending food to, to the USSR, you know, anything to make a profit. Um, so they could afford to destroy the peasantry. But the peasantry in Ukraine, especially in Stalin's mind, in Lenin's mind, certainly in Trotsky's mind, were nationalists. They were they were orthodox people and they could never be trusted. And that's where the uh, the Holocaust against uh, Ukrainians came from. They need to be liquidated because because they said they're never going to be at home in the Soviet system. And no peasantry, no peasant was ever at home in the Soviet system. The, the traditional Jewish loathing for the agricultural life really came to the fore there. But so long as the West is feeding them, they don't have to worry about destroying their own agricultural foundation. And food production plummeted uh, in the 20s and 30s and even afterward. And uh, the U.S. was financing uh, Russia during the during the, the war and helped Russia rebuild. It, it's a common myth that that Stalin was 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 not included in, in the Marshall Plan. That is true that that he's you know, because the Russians would have to turn over their um, their books to, to the U.S. if they to qualify for Marshall Plan aid. No, they came up with a very I have this uh, written elsewhere, a different plan named after someone else. Who I can't remember right now just for Stalin's Russia. So, you know, the U.S. was involved in encouraging uh, the Gulag system. And this is when it was very, very well known what Stalin had done in uh, in Ukraine. I firmly believe I, I don't have tons. This is kind of a pet theory. I don't have tons of proof for it right now. I believe this is what Joe McCarthy was destroyed for. Uh, Joe McCarthy uh, wasn't so much going to go after the army, uh, but he was going to turn over all of the receipts that Anthony Sutton eventually found that American capitalists, uh, the big companies, uh, almost without exception, financed the gulags, designed them, created them. Uh, General Electric, you know, created the whole infrastructure, uh, the Soviet Union, not just the gulags. And he was going to turn this all over and make this available to the American public. And um, it is it is one of the most bizarre things that no one knows that that's true. And I, I believe this is what McCarthy was was um, was getting ready to do, that American capitalism uh, supported Soviet Bolshevism, and the only time it ever got antsy about the Soviet Union was when they threatened to create a trading bloc that the West would be cut out of. The only time they, they became, and then as Woodrow Wilson would say, the only time that they would oppose the Soviet Union is when they acted like the czars, which was, which was their way of, of saying, uh, acted in a nationalist, uh, independent, patriotic kind of a way. Um, you see, uh, I have another quote uh, a bit further down, um, and he, he writes that 1929, uh, Lenin and the national question. Remember, Lenin had him, Stalin was the minister for nationalities in the very early Soviet government. Uh, but he does say that once we finance revolution in all the countries of the world, at least all the industrial uh, countries of the world, um, slowly there will be created a single universal language that we will all speak. Um, and that will make you know commerce you know, make a lot more sense. And then the next stage, as he calls it, of the dictatorship of the proletariat, 
um, there'll be one culture, one language. I have that is, um, uh, he, I, I, I have him here, a uh, quote, national differences and languages will begin to die away and make room for a world language common to all nations, end quote. Now, that's in 1929, um, either during or just after his tenure as, as a minister. He's talking about in the entire world here. So uh, people who want to believe that he was some sort of, a, this is, is outrageous. He was probably more internationalist than, than Lenin was. Uh, uh, it, isn't, it isn't every day that even Soviets would, would talk about the creation of a world language. But Stalin was very interested in seeing that uh, come to pass. So it's just absolutely outrageous that, that Russia specialists today will not say any of this. I can, you know, I could send it to them. I have sent it to them. I've confronted Russia scholars uh, in, in this country at dozens of universities, and it doesn't penetrate. They don't want it to penetrate. Um, the Jewish question there, I give them a list of the Bolsheviks who took over, give them all their names, they see it's Jewish, they they walk away. You know, they're scared to death of this stuff, or they get angry, um, short circuit in their brains, and they, they, just, they just lose it. It's just that uh, facts here don't, don't seem to matter. Um, but as I said before, the, 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 the struggle um, against the Soviet Union was a struggle against nationalism. So long as the Soviet Union was a part of the world economy, and it was, it was okay and the U.S. was heavily, heavily invested in it. I mean, the U.S. government simply can't ban uh, investments without good reason. Ronald Reagan, even in the 80s, he tried to ban high-tech uh, sales to the Soviet Union that clearly had a military um, purpose, and he failed. He was overruled. Uh, you know, there was no question about it. The computer revolution in Russia uh, came from the West. It all came from the West. Henry Ford, as I like to remind people, invested in Soviet Ukraine in the 30s. Big anti-communist Henry Ford um, created the largest truck plant in the world in Soviet Ukraine. And all of the Russian automobiles, uh, everything from, from Jeeps to, to, um, to limousines, come from that one plant. They call it the, the Russian Ford. And, uh, and so if you could make profit there, uh, they, they would do it. And capitalism was, was not, not destroying itself, but creating this, creating this uh, so-called evil empire uh, and was trading with it consistently aiding it, uh, bailing it out of trouble consistently from uh, 1918 to 19, 1990. Nowhere near. Now, today, we have a threat of nuclear war with Putin. Every uh, major party in America and in the West is, is condemning Putin and screaming for war. No one's quite sure why, that what he has done that deserves World War III, but they're screaming for it. Never, any more, not even during the Cuban Missile Crisis, did you have this kind of rhetoric. Never did you have uh, this kind of uh, vicious attack uh, on, on Russia. And the reason is that Putin is a nationalist, that he's Christian, and that he is showing that there is a third way of development. And it seems that you know, my, my book on, on Putin has the thesis that the view of Putin and Amer American political, and economic, and journalistic elites is a projection of their own weakness. They project their own failures onto Putin. Putin is everything that they're not. And it explains a lot about their uh, insane rhetoric about him, especially since the man has done nothing wrong, hasn't threatened the U.S. in any conceivable way. But a war with Russia is a war with China. Hillary Clinton has threatened Russia with war uh, dozens of times throughout, uh, throughout her campaign. And I don't know why there's not mass panic, because both Russia and China are engaged in, in heavy preparations for nuclear war right now. Uh, mass preparations uh, involving, you know, millions of people. Why is there not mass panic in this country? Uh, so, uh, you know, Stalin gets aid, Khrushchev gets aid, Putin gets attacked. It was never Bolshevism. That was not a problem. Most American politicians don't know what Bolshevism is. They couldn't define it for you. They couldn't define communism for you. That wasn't the issue. Nationalism was always the target then and now. Thank you very much, Matt. And we're coming near the end of our time, so uh, I want to thank you for joining me. And uh, essentially, I mean, what you said about uh, Russia preparing, um, I, I read articles, uh, we're recording this a couple of weeks before it goes out, it's the 7th of October as I uh, am recording this with Matt, um, but only uh, a few days ago they were running 
uh, drills in Russia. They've got all these, uh, you know, nuclear shelters built that can, you know, look after millions of people. So they're well aware of it. But I don't know of any nuclear shelters around where I live or what have you. Uh, and just to conclude, I want to thank you so much for joining me, Matt. And uh, that was a great article. And for me, it makes Stalin sound like the ultimate Chavez goy. So I want to thank you all for listening. I'll be back with you all soon. Bye for now.